because as, because as a woman you want to wear nice lingerie and you want to feel glamorous and attractive, but you don't. A great big pad doesn't have the same effect. So dealing with incontinence is a bummer. Um, but I thought I'd just leave the final word to this. Um, I don't know if it's big enough. Can you read it? Okay. One of our questions, how would you rate life as a whole? Completely satisfied, 7.78% said yes. Mostly satisfied, 72% said yes. So that's 80% who are satisfied and mostly satisfied. That's okay, eh? Neutral, 12%. Mostly dissatisfied, 5%. Completely dissatisfied, 2%. So 80% of the 90 re people who responded to that question are, are satisfied or completely satisfied. And so that indicates to me that transition overall is going quite well. You know, it doesn't mean to say it cannot be improved. And just as a footnote, one group of people who find transition particularly difficult were the walkers, because walkers they, uh, very often their gait is affected and they can be seen as drunk or uh, un, you know, under the influence of some sort or maybe even intellectually impaired. They may also, um, they don't get the same sympathy as someone sitting in a wheelchair. They may also have problems with bladder and bowel control and they're walking and so that's really difficult too for them. Um, and on that note, I want to finish. Thank you. very much. It's a real privilege to be here and I look forward to the other pre presentations that we're going to have later in the afternoon and also to your feedback when we have a bit of a wider discussion uh, after my presentation. Uh, so um, I'm actually from Otago, or, although I'm, I'm actually retired, um, so, but I'm still, as you can see, doing a bit of work. Um, so I'm going to talk about socioeconomic outcomes uh, following uh, spinal cord injury. See if I can work that. Okay, I think everything on this slide we've already uh, talked about, so I'll go on to the next one. Uh, so when we originally got funding from the Health Research Council, we had two main aims. The first one was to explore the relationship between body, self and society for people living with spinal cord injury. And the second was to investigate how entitlement to rehabilitation and compensation affect socioeconomic and health outcomes. And actually, I'm going to talk about socioeconomic outcomes rather than health outcomes, although there are a few health outcomes in uh, what I'm going to present. Now, we call <coughs> this study a natural experiment because we're comparing people who've all had a spinal cord injury, but in a way it's an accident of fortune which makes it sort of like an experiment, whether they end up in the group that gets ACC or not. So it depends on whether they have their they have a traumatic injury, whether it's overseas or in New Zealand, or whether they have a disease process versus a, um, uh, an, an, uh, an injury. You can imagine in a real experiment, you randomise people to get ACC or to get Ministry of Health funding. Uh, and then the two groups should be exactly the same, apart from chance, that they might differ. 
In this case, of course, the people that are a bit different. And one of the things we want to look at is how they differ and then try and adjust for that. So we can make that comparison. Uh, in, um, and of course, the reason that as well we're interested in doing this is that I think it's been a long standing sense of injustice in New Zealand society that people who have an injury get ACC and people who have some disease process get uh, much less. So we wanted, we're really the first people, we actually are the first people to actually investigate this injustice, if you like, and look at what it's made of, and therefore to think about what might be done about it. Right, okay. Um, so this is uh, about who's eligible and who's not eligible for ACC. So people who have a traumatic injury are eligible, uh, and people also who have a treatment injury, so they may actually suffer a stroke through a treatment injury. They uh, may well be eligible for ACC. That provides conversation 80% of pre-injury income for those who are in the job, uh, sometimes lump sum payments, support services, home and vehicle modification. For those who don't get ACC, their um, spinal cord injury due to some non-traumatic disease process um, or a, 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 an injury sustained outside uh, New Zealand. And they receive the same in-unit rehabilitation uh, but afterwards, their health services differ somewhat and their, their, their access to um, compensation is, is means-tested benefits. Uh, which means that, in fact, if, if in a couple, two of them are working and one of them sustained a spinal cord injury, the other one will not get any, uh, any compensation for their lost income. Of course, unless they have private uh, 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 income insurance. Okay, so this is the second of the studies that we've done on this, looking at this comparison. So we actually did earlier a comparison of people who had um, an injury as part of the prospective outcomes of injury study who all got ACC. Uh, and we compared those to people throughout New Zealand in the same areas who'd had a stroke in, this, in the same age group uh, up to 64. Um, and we found that uh, this, and this just looked over 12 months, but the median income declined um, by 13% in the injury group and by 60% in the illness group. So there were these very uh, major differences. Uh, that paper was published in Social Science and Medicine last year, actually, and Sarah, oh no, Sue was the first author. <laughs> um, uh, in fact, Sue soon because did her PhD on this topic. And we also found that return to work was higher in the injury group, and we were surprised about that because these were people who were getting earned related compensation. We thought it might be the other way around, that if you didn't get earned related compensation, the push to get back to work would be stronger. But of course, the other thing to think about is that these groups are a bit more different an injury of a whole variety of different sorts of injury versus a stroke. So they also did have some uh, differences. Right, okay, um, now two spinal units, you know about that. Um, recruitment, you know about this as well. Uh, uh, Martin's already gone, uh, uh, <coughs> told you about that, so I'll just skip over it. Um, and also, he's talked about the process. Yes? Were people with head injuries included or excluded? <coughs> people with head injuries. Yeah. Um, so, if they were able to take part in an interview, they were included but not otherwise. Um, okay, so I've gone over the process, and I just want to, although we concentrated on 16 to 64, we actually collected information, or some basic information, on everybody who came into the spinal units. And one of the reasons for that was that we wanted to be able to calculate incidence rates. That's the new occurrences of spinal cord injury uh, over a particular year. And you can see here that our estimated annual incidence was 30 per million. So it's obviously it's rare. And that 30 per million, we looked at a whole lot of other studies that have been done across the world. And that's sort of somewhere in the, in the middle in terms of different countries and their rates. When we looked at age-adjusted rates, of course, the populations are really different for Māori and, and Pacific and um, European New Zealanders. And we found that it was lower was 29 per million, so that, as you expect, similar to the overall rate, higher amongst Māori, 
46 per million per year, and particularly high amongst specific people at 70 per million uh, per year. And for other ethnicities, um, including Asian, it was actually, it was actually lower. Okay, but today, um, and we might come back to that, in fact I'd like to come back to thinking about these very high rates amongst specific at the end. Um, and that paper's been published. So today I'm going to talk about the uh, group age 16 to 64, and again we've already talked about those numbers, 118 participated in the first interview, 103 and 91. Uh, but this now, we're dividing people up into AC, whether they got ACC or whether they didn't. And you can see 93 were covered by ACC and 25 were not covered by ACC. So that's pretty small numbers. And so we can only do some fairly big analyses and not very fine ones. Um, okay. So this shows you the basic uh, data collection information that we collected. So we're interested in uh, characteristics before a spinal cord injury, which were of course collected afterwards at the first interview, about four months. Uh, the post spinal cord injury characteristics, <coughs> we're interested in the age of impairment scale, general health status, I'm going to show you those. And outcomes here, I'm going to look at return to work and uh, amongst those who are working at the time of their spinal cord uh, injury and uh, some other measures, some measures of socioeconomic status, personal income, material standard of living, and household income adequacy. Okay, so this is now comparing the two groups. Remember, we're in, in a, in a randomised trial that these groups would be the same, but they're a bit different, actually. So with the pre-spinal cord injury characteristics, the only things that were different were the social demographic. Age, I think you'd be unsurprised that people who had disease process, the non ACC group were older. Uh, and actually, they were more likely to be women. Uh, uh, that is, I've, I've got the numbers here. Uh, yeah. um, so, 18% in the ACC group were women. That's overwhelmingly a male issue for. Um, uh, for, for injury, but 40% uh, were women in the, in the uh, disease, in the non-ACC group. Um, but for the other things, there were no statistically significant differences between the two groups, which was very good for us, because we could make a better comparison between the two groups. Um, okay, so now I want to come on to some results, and I hope you probably can't see this terribly well, but I'll just take you through it. So one of the things that we wanted to know was were, were the trajectories of recovery in terms of health status different between the two groups? So these graphs are really hard to read, I mean, partly because it's small, but, but more particularly because of the way they go. So these were, for the general health status, we used this thing called the EQ5D, and Sarah's international expert for New Zealand on the EQ5D, which uh, stands for the... <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, I would have called the Euro Qual, but it's, it's not anymore. Okay. And 5D must be five dimensions. And we added a sixth dimension. So you can see these dimensions. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. No, that's not um, So you can see the dimensions are mobility, self care, usual activities, pain, discomfort, anxiety, depression, and cognition. Now, the cognition is the sixth one. and uh, Sarah and her colleagues have worked out a way of making it another dimension which is really important in this case. And the other thing I want you to notice is that the y-axis says important with any problems. So you can see, say, from mobility, that at the outset, at six months, actually most people had any problems, nearly 100% had any problems, and the fact they're falling over time is a good thing. That's fewer people reporting any problems, just so that you don't think they're really odd. And you notice also this, it says six months, 18 months, and 30 months. And actually, um, uh, Martin said six months, 12 months, and 24 months, which is what they're supposed to be. But actually, we looked at the meantime, you know, interviews were actually held somewhat later than we hoped. 
So actually our mean time's fit much better with it being uh, 18 months and 30 months. So we actually go out to two and a half years. Uh, and you can see that, um, again, very reassuringly, the two groups, so the red one, the, the, the blue one is the ACC group and the red one is the non-ACC <laughs> group, that they show a very similar pattern, except for cognition. And you can see that for cognition, the proportion with any problems goes on dropping for the ACC group. Well, some of those would have had head injuries, but it goes on dropping. Whereas for the uh, non-ACC group, it actually increases in that last period. So obviously that's important for us to take into account when we're doing the analysis. It's very small numbers, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, okay. Oh yes, that's, that's <laughs> to show you that. Okay, so return to work. Now I'm going to show you the whole cohort, whole cohort to begin with. So this is everybody with ACC or not ACC. Amongst those in paid employment before their spinal cord injury and followed to 18 months and then followed to 30 months. So you see the numbers, the proportions drop down. Return to work at 18 months, 42% return to work by 30 months, 49%. Now, <coughs> Sue and Sarah and I I've looked at a whole lot of other papers. There's lots of work done on return to work, as I'm sure many of you are aware. And actually, th this is quite good, this return to work. is actually quite high uh, compared with um, many studies overseas. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, now, here's what we were particularly interested in. Sorry, this is a rather busy slide. So this is return to work comparing people getting ACC and those not getting ACC. So um, by 18 months, quite similar actually, 42% of the ACC group and 39% of the non-ACC group had returned to work. Uh, and by 30 months, 49% of the ACC group and 29% of the non-ACC group had returned to work. Now, the one thing you might notice is there seem to be more of the non-ACC group who have returned to work at 18 months than at 30 months. So that will be a mixture of the fact there's slightly different people there, depending on who we got at the different times. But it's also partly that, and as people know, we've done much work in this area, people can go back to work and then they can not, not sustain it and then and move back out of the workplace. So again, we were surprised, but it's similar to our stroke and injury study, that actually people on ACC got back to work quicker. Now, of course, we wondered whether it was some other characteristics, the age or sex or cognition. So we did, a, we did a, a, an adjusted relative risk, just quite hard to interpret it, comparing the ACC and non-ACC groups. And even with our adjustment for age and sex and cognition, we found that the uh, non-ACC groups were less likely to get back to work. But it wasn't statistically significant, and we can't really, we can't hang our hat on that, because for those of you who are interested in these things, the 95% confidence limit were very wide. They went from 0.27 up to 1.24. Okay. Um, This is return to work and ethnicity, and again, because of small numbers, we couldn't look more closely at this. Um, am, I, am I going too slowly, or am I all right? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, just to, to, to tell you that comparing um, with Māori and Pacific <laughs> population uh, uh, and, and non Māori Pacific, very similar proportions were, were actually in work at the outset. 82% and 84%, practically the same, but at 18 months, Fewer Māori and Pacific were back at work, and also fewer back at work at, uh, at 44 months compared with the non-Māori and Pacific. Okay, so now we're on to the direct um, socioeconomic outcomes, and we asked about, one of the things we asked about was uh, standard of living, um, and again, this is like the, the way around you don't expect. So this is the proportion who reported medium or low standard of living, and they were asked to say that their standard of living was high, fairly high, medium, fairly low, or low. And you can see that uh, the blue groups, the ACC group, that they 
Fast stand to the living. This is so this is a medium low proportion. It actually didn't change much over that time. It's slightly worse, but in the middle here, but whereas the standard of living for the non-ACC group got worse to 18 months and then recovered a bit. Um, the next question we asked was about household income adequacy and the same sort of thing. They were asked whether there was uh, more than enough, enough, just enough or not enough. And this combines just and not enough. <coughs> and again, if there's an increase, then it means there's more we've got just or not enough. So more that are badly off. And you can see this is a slightly different picture and, and more extreme, but you can see that for the non-ACC group, quite a, a lot more had uh, just or not enough at 18 months and sustained at 30 months. It was slightly worse for the ACC group, uh, but these were statistically significant differences between the two groups. Then we looked at median personal incomes uh, at... Uh, and not everybody gave us this, and again, slightly different numbers over time depending on who we interviewed. But you can see this very graphic difference that the non ACC group started off with a slightly lower median income, but it was not significantly different. It, the ACC group had stayed very, very, very static and actually went up a bit in the last period, but we sort of looked at that and we think it's partly slightly different people. So, ACC group sustained their, stand, their income, whereas for the non-ACC group, their income fell so that by the, by the end it was half the, the income of the ACC group. Uh, so that's the most um, striking uh, finding and highly statistically significant. Okay, so um, to conclude about this, for the whole cohort, overall personal income, standard living and adequacy household income decreased slightly to 18 months and then stabilised to 30 months. This is for the whole cohort. Um, uh, the increase in return to work for those who were in paid employment was 42% by 18 months and 49% by 30 months. Return to work was lower amongst Māori and Pacific participants. Um, comparing groups, return to work rates were higher amongst the ACC group, although that was not statistically significant. Median income for the ACC group remained similar through the 30 months. Amongst the non-ACC group, median income fell to less than half of the ACC group. And the adjusted relative risk uh, oh, showed that, that a significantly lower uh, proportion of the non-ACC group had not enough, not enough or just enough income at 30 months. The difference was less for material standard of living. Just to say something quickly about the strengths and weaknesses of our study, it was population based, it was prospective with relatively high response rate and again we've all I think looked at a lot of studies around the world and often they're just prospective so you really can't tell what's going on so it's really good design. It's, it does underrepresent Māori and Pacific populations and who have the highest incidence of, of spinal cord injury and that was partly because um, fewer of them um, agreed to take part or were able to be found for the first interview and um, also because fewer of them continued. Um, and that small numbers precluded us exploring whether anything different was going on for, for my Pacific with ACC and non-ACC. It also underrepresents those with most severe spinal cord injury at the final time period, not, not at the beginning. Um, there were some differences between the two groups, but not very many, and we adjusted them in the analysis. But actually, we were also just interested, even if they were different. Why should being sicker or having poorer cognition mean that you should end up on less income? You know, it's not, it's not obvious. It may be true that you'd be less likely to get back to work, uh, and that would be completely understandable. Most people retain their pre-injury SCI. Reasons and, and return to work back rates are relatively high. The reason for both the findings fear to be the provision of no fault compensation for most New Zealanders who sustain a spinal cord injury. It helps prevent a downward spiral to poverty where um, ill health leads to further declines. 
um, such a no-fault compensation scheme should be seen as a model for rehabilitation after a spinal cord injury for all, both traumatic and non-traumatic, because that's what we'd like to see. And we think there should be further research to uh, explore the effects of um, ACC on wider quality of life, and also to look to map at the qualitative findings with the quantitative findings to, to help understand exactly how ACC is affecting uh, these outcomes and we need to understand more about specific peoples in particular and spinal cord injury, both the reasons for the higher incidence and the outcomes. I'm going to stop there, almost like but I think I will stop. But just to say that this paper has been published uh, quite recently in Spinal Cord, and we actually do have uh, some reprints of the paper if anybody would like to have one.